Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank God for the Word of God. Amen. <clears throat> and thank God for what's happening in this meeting, which is having repercussions and will have repercussions far beyond we who are setting or standing here today in this sanctuary. Amen. Let me read a, a scripture and then I'll let you be seated. Um, I want to read from Romans chapter 9, one verse there, Romans chapter 9 and verse 13. As it is written, Romans 9 and 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And then where that scripture actually came from is Malachi chapter 1, where Paul is quoting from the last prophet of the Old Testament. And chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And in just a few minutes, I want to preach to you for a little while on <clears throat> Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You may be seated. I think it's important today for us to realize that last night and this morning, God has spoken to us in a tremendous fashion, and <clears throat> while Brother Bass was preaching last night, I was thinking about the fact that for 400 years there had not been a miracle, and then <clears throat> Mary got to have a little ignition point to show her that her miracle was going to happen, and Elizabeth was her connection, and what a powerful and then from that, there's all kinds of things that run out from that, implications for you and I. Thank you, Brother Bass, for an, a word from God. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. And then uh, uh, Brother Bo just preached so uh, incredibly this morning and gave us... Uh, <clears throat> It just makes you want to go grab a dust mop. Amen. Just, man, this is going to be the cleanest church in history ten minutes after service. And uh, every saint, every preacher, all of us are going to be saying, my God, just give me something. We, we may paint this 400 colors in here before we get out of here today. Because we're just excited about doing something for Jesus. But thank you, Brother Bo, for that tremendous Word of God today. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. And uh, Brother Haddon was mumbling around behind me, and he said, Every church needs to hear this message. And I believe that. I believe that. Amen. So uh, we need to just put Brother Bo on a schedule. It doesn't matter whether he likes us or not. He just needs to obey like obed -Edom. And <laughs> just put him on schedule and go through churches in America preaching that one message. That's his job. <laughs> hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the Word of God. I want to preach to you for a little while today. Really, I'm intrigued by this statement that a loving God makes that Esau have I hated. This is, uh, <clears throat> there couldn't be many 
statements in Scripture that would be more sobering than of God's relationship with an individual than this one that Esau have I hated. Not only did he say he hated him, but this word hate here is the strongest word for hate. We want to, we want to soften it. We want to, well, what it really means is, you know, God disapproved of his actions or whatever to try to soften the impact of it, but it really means odious. It means, it means God hated him. So how could God come to hate a person, which is where we're going here when the Bible says, for God so loved the world, it seems so contradictory to the rest of Scripture. And if God's capable of hating somebody to any degree, any human being, then I want to know what it is about a person's character or what elements it is of being human that would make God hate somebody. And what is it, what is it that we can find in the Word of God that is this terrible, terrible thing that would make God hate somebody? So, when you read the book of Genesis, there's so much in it you could preach for a hundred years out of the book of Genesis, but when you read it, you will, of course, immediately see that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are written to people in general and that God was dealing with the human race in general and that he did not have specificity when he was talking about dealing with people. It was just everybody in general. Until you come to a general rebellion, which is what Brother Bo was talking about in Genesis chapter 11 with Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, which was a, represented a worldwide rebellion. So a worldwide rebellion against God's methodology of dealing with people in general triggered in God a response of how he would handle that worldwide rebellion. So already, uh, the book of Genesis deals with universals. It deals with, it deals with things that are just way out there. It deals with generalities. And here, God is, if you please, determining. I started to say figuring out, but God doesn't have to figure things out. But God is determining how He is going to react to a world that is in rebellion. You just got to know that in the struggle for dominion in the universe, God is going to win. Amen. Amen. And, and in the struggle for the universe, God is not going to do this struggle uh, by reducing the scope of his plan. He is going to do all that he determined to do in the beginning. And when he called Abraham, he was not creating a reduction of the plan that he had to reach the universe and to be the God of the entire world, the planetary system, and everything that's involved. All that happened was that God changed the way that he was going to do this. And the way he's going to do it now is rather than doing it unmediated, that is, God straight to the world, he's going to do it mediated. He's going to mediate his reach for the world through a man named Abraham. And he is going to use this man and he's going to create out of this man a family uh, of which all the people essentially that Brother Bo just preached about are, are downline descendants of this man, Abraham, that God called in Genesis chapter 12. 
And he gave this special purpose to Abraham, which was to uh, conduct their lives to reveal to people what earth life will look like where God reigns in the world, which is part of what living for God today is in all of the uh, dictums concerning our appearance and all of the things about your body not being your own and all the things that has to do with standards and so forth, showing forth, exemplifying what life on earth looks like where God's kingdom reigns. Uh, That people was also to be a model of wholeness and of redemption. It was to be able to be the medium whereby God would bring back to the world uh, uh, the wholeness that was lost in the garden. So you can see here there's a whole list of broad, general, universal implications involved in the call of Abraham and the movement of God to develop him and his family. They were to be the medium for reconciliation of all that had been lost in Adam and all that had been lost in the fall. And as such, God essentially is putting all of his eggs in one basket. God essentially is saying, this is the sack that I'm putting all of my hopes and dreams and desires for fulfillment of my kingdom to come to the earth. It's coming by choosing Abraham and Isaac and Esau and Jacob. These are people who are people of destiny. The next thing is if you look at Isaac and Esau and Jacob, Isaac the son of Abraham, Esau and Jacob the sons of Isaac and the grandsons of Abraham, they had no choice but to have the destiny that was laid upon them. I'm not going to preach about this today. But it is a subject worth pondering when we say, well, every man's got a choice to do what he wants to do with his life. I'm not so sure that that is true. Uh, in fact, I'm convinced that there's great limitations attached to that statement. I know that a person can do what they want to do. I know that Esau, in fact, is an example of a man that did what he wanted to do. But you can't, you can't do it without consequences. And when you are a people who is caught in a line of destiny, when your daddy is Isaac and when your grandpa is Abraham and they have been destined by God before you were ever born, you were, according to Hebrews in talking about tithing and talking about Levi tithing to Melchizedek while he was in the loins of of his father Abraham indicates very clearly that in God's mind there is a connection of destiny down line with the children. God said to, God said to Aaron, He said, you and your sons shall be the priest. The sons didn't even get a choice in it. Nobody even asked the sons what they thought about it. The sons were just, they were just part of it. They were, they were caught in a web of destiny that was inescapable. And here we are today in apostolic Pentecost. Uh, this is a day in which these subjects have to be addressed uh, because we have had fathers and grandfathers and mothers and grandmothers and now great grand fathers and great-grandmothers and in some case great-great-grandfathers and great-great-grandmothers who have plowed a path in our churches and have preached the gospel. And uh, when I say preach the gospel, I'm not just talking about an individual man standing in a pulpit. When he preaches and the people respond, that church is preaching the gospel. And so we have saints that are with children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and in some cases great-great-grandchildren who are apostolic. And they are caught in this. They are caught in this. I'm just going to tell you today that in the final analysis, there's no way out of this. Uh, 
There is no way out of the responsibility that is upon you young men that are here today. That comes by virtue of the fact that the, the Holy Ghost has been in your family. The Holy Ghost and obedience to God and all that that entails is part and parcel. You're not your own. And you will never be allowed to make all of your decisions without radical implications in your life. I'm sorry. That's not the way it is. Amen. That's not the way it is. You are in a lineage uh, and uh, this is no longer a matter of choice. Now, I know you can backslide, but you cannot get away. You that are listening today that are backsliders, let me tell you, you cannot get away. The only thing you can do to assuage permanently your mind, perhaps, and I'm not sure this even does it. I'm not sure you can be alive and completely assuage your mind and still have a mind. And that is if you become reprobate. But even reprobates, I think there is part of them that knows, that knows, that cannot escape. There's something about the power of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We talk about it in terms of salvation, but the Holy Ghost marks a man. There, when you are, when you are, when you are a child of God, when you have been called to be the people of God, there is something about that that you cannot and you never will escape. Oh, let's thank Him for the privilege. And so I don't know, I don't know if there's anything that is more holy than, than being tapped by God and marked for purpose before birth. Like numerous Jeremiah and, and John the Baptist and others were marked by God before they were even born. What a, what a sobering thought. The sovereignty of God. And somebody says, well, I don't think that's right. Some agnostic or atheist says, I think we ought to have the right to do what we want to do. Well, then go do it. Do whatever you want to do. If you want to go to hell, go to hell. But I got to tell you, that's really not the final statement about this. There's more to it. There is a marking. There is a sovereignty of God. When you juxtapose the sovereignty of God against the free will of man, you have the great, never completely unraveled mystery about mankind and their destiny. And nobody in the Bible is caught in this more Intricately than is Esau, the man that we're preaching about today. He is a man who lost his house. I noticed last night while Brother um, Bass was reaching his text and in, 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 in reading his text. In fact, if you have uh, Luke chapter 1, if you can pull it up back there, verse 31 through 33. He read this last night. And I noticed this uh, while it was being read. I'll read it to you, and if it comes up, you can follow along. It's talking about Jesus, and it's talking about his birth. And it says, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Listen to this. Listen to this. Ter- these terms. He shall be great. That's talking about in the world, and in his case, out of the world. And shall be called the son of the highest. That's the highest is the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And so that is a throne that has many promises. Notice the next line. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom. This is talking about Jesus. There shall be no end. But you'll notice there that there also will be no end to the house of Jacob. 
because he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. But in rational terms, that should not say the house of Jacob. In rational terms, that ought to say the house of Esau because it was his. And over 20 times in the Bible, the Bible talks about the house of Jacob. And it talks about numerous other times the house of Israel, which is the name Jacob's name was changed to. The house of Jacob. There ought to be someone that says, why is it called the house of Jacob? When it was really the house of Esau. And he was the man who lost his house. How sad it is. How did it happen that he lost his house? And this scripture about Esau have I hated has engendered more historic discussion about predestination and about the fact that some have no chance to be saved than any other scripture, I'm sure, in the Bible. And what's really... The truth today is this is really not about predestination. It's really about the nature of opportunity. And we need to stop for a little while today because this is so relevant to the apostolic movement in the very time in which we're living. And we need to study the subject of opportunity. We need to explore how opportunity works. For example, opportunity presents itself, but it always presents itself among contradictory possibilities. Opportunity never presents itself as no chance to make a different decision. It always comes in the presence of contradiction. From the time of Eve in the garden onward, there is choice in terms of opportunity. And these possibilities, which way to go, can be pondered together, but they can never be actualized together. You can't have the world and have the church. It can be pondered. It can be thought about, but it can never be actualized. At some point, choice is necessary. It's either pottage or birthright. It's either stomach or soul. It's either flesh or spirit. There's never going to be a time that the church can be both. And I would propose to you that right now the apostolic movement is trying to have both. You can ponder both, but you can never have both. They're contradictory possibilities. And each of them, you can embrace one of them, but never can they both be actualized together. And that's what people are trying to do in the time in which we're living. Oh, let's thank God for His Word today. You may be seated. Because the truth is, when you confer existence to one possibility by action in the moment of decision with equal decisiveness you have just dismissed all other possibilities we need to get this down it's the proverbial you cannot have your cake and eat it too let me say that again to convert confer existence the way you do that is you Make a choice and you act on it. That is conferring existence. That makes a possibility come into existence. When you do that, in the moment of that decision, with equal decisiveness, you have dismissed all other possibilities. So this is what makes decision making so critical and so sobering. Because the moment of action precludes further attempts to reconcile the opposites. Because when you act, when you make a decision, then it removes 
all of the opposites and can only, if you try to keep both of them, it can only lead to that dreaded word, a compromise. And when it comes to a compromise, it turns away from the opportunity altogether and everything is lost. And so this moment of decision bestows existence on one possibility and decision is what turns the possibility into reality. And so how long did Esau live with the possibility before him, knowing that the birthright was his, uh, and resting in that assurance of comfort that the birthright is his, uh, although although the results of it have not yet been conferred uh, on him. He knows that it belongs to him, and it cannot be taken from him. Sometimes someone may say, but, but, but if, if God loved the other one and hated the first, he could get away from giving it to him. But that's not true. The book of Deuteronomy has a scripture that specifically addresses this and says, uh, if the son of the birthright is hated, uh, he still has to be given the birthright uh, rather than the son that is beloved. There is no way to get around this. The only way... The only way that this birthright can be lost uh, is if it is given away. It cannot be lost because God took it. It cannot be lost because anybody made it go away. And so you can think all day long about the birthright, but what is true for thought is not true for action. With thought, you're entering the timeless place of God, of pondering things, uh, And thinking about them. But action is in the fleeting present time. A person makes a decision in real time. And when they make that decision, uh, it is a key thing that cannot be retrieved uh, on major decisions. Uh, And so when you think about it long enough, you can stay in the abstract and you can keep thinking about it and you can keep pondering it. uh, But finally, when you make that decision... It pulls it out of the abstract into the concrete and it leaves the person living with the results of that decision. And so when you look, when you look at, 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 at this decision making process and the exacting necessity that goes with it of fusing in oneself a single possibility with them uh, to the exclusion of all others because this is what life situations demands. Uh, This is why people run from decision making. This is why people fear that teenagers are making decisions without enough equipment to know how to make them. Uh, Amen. I'm thinking of young people that get caught up in immorality or that are, that are seduced by somebody older. Hear me today. Uh, you need to listen to those that know what the consequences are of decisions far better than you do and where that's going to take you and what that's going to entail and what that's going to mean in the long run. Amen. And so here is Esau. He's lived his life thus far Until now, destiny has finally cornered him. You can evade all of this for a long time. But finally, destiny has cornered him. And he is a son of Isaac. And he is a grandson of Abraham. And he is called of God. And he is of a long Lineage now. And it is a holy and sacred, strange words in our world, a holy and sacred uh, responsibility that is laid upon him. And to Esau we have to say, Esau, you're bought with a price. You're not your own. You cannot get away from this. Not only the birthright, but later the blessing. Both of them. This is something you cannot escape. And when he loses the birthright to jump ahead a little little bit later, you could have counted on it that he would lose the blessing also. Maybe that's what Jesus meant when he said, But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, and given to him which hath. And so once, once Jacob gets the birthright, 
it seems wrong for him to also get the blessing. But to him that hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, ah, a brutal world we're living in. A world of hardball. A world where when you make decisions, there is a downward regression or an upward progression. And there's no escaping the results of making these decisions. Uh, These decisions that have eternal consequences and destiny written all over them. That's the, that's the fearful thing that we're setting among today because we're dealing in universals uh, and we're dealing in a long genealogy of the people of God and we're dealing in what God, the very thing that God is using to mastermind the universe uh, is the people of God. Esau, don't you get that? Uh, it is, you're messing with God's eternal purpose. Uh, When you mess with your own life. uh, And if you don't get this straight. It's going to have draconian results in your life. Come on. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Amen. And so. You cannot remain in childhood irresponsibility. He's a hunter drifting through the dreamy forest, crafting and refining his sport. Don't think it wasn't sport. When it says he was a hunter, it includes the context of sport. He is crafting his sport. And don't for a minute think they had to have the meat to eat on the table because it didn't take five minutes to go out and get a goat out back and fix it and fool him and think it was venison. And so Jacob went out and got it. They had a whole pen full of, it's not about food. It was about sport. It was about selfish interest. And so all kinds of avoidance mechanisms can appear to keep from making these decisions, such as sheltering ourselves in banal activity. God's got his hand on some of you young people that are here today, and God put his hand on me when I was a young person and long before I could drive a car legally God put that on us put it on my wife and put it on other people that are here and living with that sometimes was banal activity that means activity that had no meaning busyness and just junk having waste time uh, is a shelter from this and then, uh, and then when you get to talking about these things, you have parents that get nervous about imposing such things on their children. They want them to be happy little children and have a good time in life. And, and so people hide in the security of convention and do not face the weight of these kinds of things. Or they escape to the world of hobbies or they escape uh, through discussions of these kind of things abstractly, but never in the context of applying them to our lives. And this is one of the things in uh, graduate classes that where we study in depth about leadership, spiritual leadership, and the dynamic and so forth. And one of the things that I try to remember is these people passing this stuff, and getting a grade, I can't let them think that matters. Because what really matters is, is it knocking them in the head? Is it making them see that where they're at is not where they could be? Are they getting a vision of something that's far beyond where they are now? Are we, is there a place where we talk about these things and where we challenge our people and ourselves towards the elements that are involved in being the called of God? And so all of these issues are part and parcel. Uh, it's easy to say that all one must do is take the range of possibilities before each of us and decide whether to address it or not. But in reality, this is not that easy. In decisions of great importance, there's another element that appears, and that element is consequence. And so the consequences and, and, uh, and the destiny pops up its head and... That it's a people of destiny that are not only pregnant with possibility, but pregnant with responsibility. And these things rest upon us. It's the classic, 
It, it always grinds down to the classic confrontation of the appetites for flesh versus the appetites for the things of God. And you can see this appetite issue uh, over and over in Scripture. Eve in the garden, it's about appetite of the flesh, eating the fruit, as opposed to appetite for the things of God. In the wilderness, it was the same cry. The children of Israel say, they weep, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. And with Jesus in the temptation, it's the same thing. Here is bread, the appetites of the world, of this present world, versus uh, the, the good world to come and all that it has for the people of God. The intensity of this is, is, is so great because if the flesh wins, that pottage, that bowl of pottage that you've got, Esau, if you, if you eat that, I know that you're hungry. I know you've come home from your sport. And I know that you are feel like you're starving to death. Uh, and I know already that you're profane. That you that means that all of this is empty to you, and you don't know how to value what you have. You don't know how to value the church. You don't know how to value the ministry. You don't know how to value the sacred trust. Uh, you don't know how to value all the things that I'm laying upon you. Esau, you're in a dangerous place here. And I would propose to you today that this entire movement is such a dangerous place right now. Amen. Amen. And so, finally, we know what happens. There's a, there's a, there's a termination of his destiny before it ever got started. And the only possible hope is one of obedience because the universal purposes of God are wrapped up in that birthright. Everybody say holy. holy. Everybody say sacred. sacred. Here's a man that disdained the holy and the sacred. He was one that chased Everything else except that. And while it seems abnormally severe what happened to him, it is the fact that God hated Esau because there's more to the story than what is told in the simple sentence, Esau, have I hated. It is the nature of Esau, of of Esau from which came the people of Edom, is the only group that it ever says in Scripture of them towards God that they greatly offended. There's no other such statement in the Bible except that Esau greatly offended. It started with him. He despised the things of God. He hated his brother. Implacably, he hated his brother. He would never release that hate. Uh, It reveals how a man passes down to his descendants not only good things, but he passes down to them bad things. For every Obed-Edom, there is an Esau. And he has passed down all of these things. From divine perspective, that birthright represented the hope for transformation of the world and God's intentions. Uh, But Esau disdains it. And when when he disdains it, It means he despised it. It was contemptible to him. And therefore, when you look at God, God says of Esau and his descendants, uh, he says, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword. He did cast off all pity. He did, in his anger, tear perpetually. And he did keep his wrath forever. When it was time for Israel to go through the land, to come to the land of promise, which was essential for them to fulfill the will of God. It was Edom that disbarred Israel from passage through their land to make entrance into God's promises. They are a roadblock to everything that God wants to do. And they cannot be forgiven for their disobedience unless they will forgive. But they won't Forgive, and nobody gets away with messing with God's people. When you look in the Bible at the Babylonians, the Babylonians 
and the Edomites were the worst people against God's people. Yet Babylon only, they only came against God's people when God's people got in their way. But Edom came against God's people when they weren't in the way. They came against God's people like nobody else did. And when the Babylonians captured Edom, the Bible says Edom uh, captured Israel. The Bible says Edom rejoiced with glee and mocked Israel's distresses. And he screams as Jerusalem falls. Down with it. Down with it. Rise it. Rise it to the ground. When it was time for them to come into the land, Edom stood in the crossway. Over and over, the whole book of Obadiah is about this. Uh, they joined the conquerors. They flew upon Israel when they were defeated and took the spoil. They captured them when they could and killed them. And when the Philistines defeated them, they came and begged for the prisoners that were God's people so that they could also kill them. Their sin was pride. They believed that they would one day ascend by going in their ways over the people of God. But God said, Thy terribleness hath deceived thee. O thou that holdest the height of the hill, though thou shouldest make thy nest high as the eagle, I will bring thee down. And thou, Edom, shall know that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel. They were hostile to God's people. When you get to the intertestamental, intertestamental period uh, in the time of the Maccabees, the Edomites are still there. History records, there's no scripture at this time, but history records that they supported the Syrians in efforts to crush the Jews. Uh, Herod the Great was a descendant of Esau, as was Herod Antipas. Uh, Herod the Great that tried to put Christ to death, and Herod Antipas, uh, which mocked Christ and said him at not. Uh, this Jesus, who is the son of Jacob, uh, carrier of Israel's birthright, versus Herod, the son of Esau. It comes all the way down. Uh, when it finally comes to the final analysis, uh, all of the Edomites ended up in Jerusalem at the time in 70 A.D. that Titus uh, uh, destroyed the city. And at that time, all of those Edomites were wiped out. And at that point, they ceased to be a people. There aren't any Edomites anymore. The whole line, the whole lineage of Esau is destroyed and is gone forever. But the house of Jacob continues to move on, continues to live on, continues to do the will of God. And so somewhere along the way, the word Esau or Edom transcended its local meaning and ascended into a symbolic meaning of everything that was demonic and everything that was anti-God. And when Romans 9 says, Esau have I hated, God's not talking there about simply a man. God is talking about a whole world of God haters. I would tell you today that all that is going on in our land and all of the cursing God and all of the contempt for His laws and all of the dismissal of the church as a force of interest in changing the world in the opinion of the world. All of that is coming down. There is a time that God's people, and I don't think it's going to wait for the rapture for it to take place. I believe that we are living in that time. That all of these coalesced forces somewhere in the vast caverns of the universe, in the gaping maw of a crevice terrifyingly deep and dark, that is the central habitation of demons, a center of darkness darker than any other place, foreboding with compressed evil beyond our ability to articulate. Over the door of that, it says, the domain of the profane, where there is nothing sacred. Those are the forces that are working in people in our world 
to try to destroy everything that is of God as though it has no meaning and it has no purpose. But on the other hand, God has a people. They are not perfect. Jacob wasn't perfect. Jacob had problems. But the one thing Jacob had was that he said, I'm after God. I'm not perfect, but I have a love for the things of God. I am moving after the things of God. I am pursuing the things of God. I am going to reach the things of God. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise Him together. Amen. It's all about where the glory is. And the glory was in the birthright and in the blessing. And all of that is all that matters in this world. When you read your Bible, you see the Bible jump. You get to Genesis 12 and it jumps from Babylon to Canaan land. And then you go a little further and it jumps from Canaan to Egypt. Why is it making these jumps? And why is that so important in terms of the world? When Genesis is writing things that God's inspiring about what's important in the world. Why does it jump from Babylon to Canaan? And then why does it jump from Canaan to Egypt? Why is it? If you were to study some of the things happening in the rest of the world, at that very time of Jacob and Esau, China was the biggest bronze-making empire in the world and was making some of the finest metals ever known. That's important to mankind. had great implications, but the Bible, of course, doesn't say anything about what was happening in China. Babylon at that time had astronomers that had already named many of the constellations and identified many of the planets at the time. They were doing that at the time of the story of Esau and Jacob. But none of that is included in the Bible. The Babylonians were also established in the thing that we call banking at the same time that this account was going on with Esau and Jacob. But the Bible has nothing to say about it. What about Europe, where most of our descendants came from? In Europe, the Celts and the Greeks and the Italians and the Germans were moving into Europe as far back as during the time of the story of Esau and of Jacob. But the Bible doesn't tell us anything about that. That's not even important in terms of the Bible. Why is it not important? Because the Bible goes where God's purposes go. The Bible doesn't go to all of that. The Bible only goes where God's purposes go. And so when you look at all of this, um, it always follows the visionary. It always follows the one that sees what God is doing and where God is going. You look at Joseph, he gets 13 chapters of the book of Genesis, almost 26%. One man. Why? Because Joseph was the dreamer. Joseph was the visionary. Joseph was the man that respected the anointing that had been placed upon his life. Joseph was the man that recognized his destiny. Joseph was the man that made the right choices. Joseph was the man that understood that he is down line from Jacob and from Isaac and from Abraham. And that no matter what happens to him, no matter how castigated, no matter how left out of the good old boy network, no matter what it takes, he knows, he knows, he knows. I follow This and God, this is where God is going. If God's going to the prison, I'm going to the prison. If God's taken through temptation, I'm going through temptation. I'm not worried about all the rest of it. Uh, I know where I have to go and I have to follow the vision of God. David's kingdom. David's kingdom. Lauded in scripture as the greatest kingdom ever found in the Bible, and a type of Christ's kingdom. David himself is sometimes his name is used when it's actually talking about Christ. Lauded to the highest heaven. When you look at David's kingdom compared to other kingdoms that existed at the time of David, 
who were much greater and much more ostentatious and much more glorious in terms of outward appeal and much bigger than David's was. And yet the Bible focuses on David and it talks about, it talks about Zion and it says walk about Zion and see all of its foundations uh, and see its mightiness. Uh, and he says, Zion, the perfection, the perfection of goodness, of holiness, and of beauty. Zion. But did you realize that at that time, the area that's identified as Zion was only about eight acres big. In the eyes of the world, it didn't have the significance that we're talking about. In the eyes of Esau, it didn't have the significance we're talking about. When you go to your college classroom, it doesn't have the significance we're talking about. On the job, they're worried about money and all of their business and enterprise. It doesn't have the significance that we're talking about. But when you're in the house of God, my foot will nigh slip until I went to the house of the Lord. In the house of God, we're dealing in eternal verities. We're dealing in universal purpose. We're dealing in things uh, that go far beyond everyday life. And we have to remember that the house of Jacob will endure forever. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. I've often thought about Jeremiah, and I'm closing, but I often thought about Jeremiah and... After his death, there's no more written about Jerusalem for many years until Ezra. And then at the time of Ezra, from Babylon and from Persia, not from Jerusalem, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Ezekiel, Daniel, all of them are writing. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar took the dreamers to Babylon and Persia. And the Bible follows them. And it follows them wherever they go because that's all that matters in this world. So when we're looking at this world and we're looking at everything to do with this world, the one thing that makes a difference, the one thing that matters is church. The one thing that matters is the people of God. The one thing that matters is the will of God in your life. The one thing that matters about you going to college is that it's not something that violates the will of God in your life. The one thing that matters about going in the military is that it's not something that violates the will of God in your life. No matter what you're doing, the one thing that matters is that the will of God in our lives is not violated. The job that you have, you may have to miss once in a while. There may be a special occasion. But if you have a job where you're missing church all of the time, it's part of your schedule. You need to start praying. You need to start saying, God, change this schedule. Or God, get me another job. Or God, do something. Because I've got to have the touch of the Holy Ghost in my life. Because that's the only thing that is eternal. Oh, let's everybody stand to our feet. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Come on. Let's do a little heart check right now. Come on. Let's do a little check in our soul and in our spirit. God, where am I in my spirit? Where am I in my heart? Where am I in my soul? What am I thinking about? What's got a hold of me? Amen. Am I thinking about the lust of the flesh? Musicians, you can come. Am I thinking about the lust of the flesh? Or am I thinking about the touch of God in my life? That is so critical. That is so critical. That is so critical. I know I am preaching to somebody today. I know I am preaching to somebody today that is caught in the web of what I'm talking about. And you're trying to justify it. And you're trying to justify the flesh. But there is no justification. You have to understand the nature of opportunity that's on you now. If you take that step, you will not find your way back. And you will mark yourself forever. You may be saved, but you will mark your future forever by making the wrong step about saying, God, I'm not changing my birthright for a bowl of pottage. Oh, come on. Let's lift our hands. Let's lift our hands. Let's make some decisions.
God, I'm making a decision here today. 